Well, joining us now is military analyst Sean Bell. Sean, good morning. Um, can you just talk to us about what happened over the weekend and, in your opinion, whether or not we will see retaliation from Israel? Morning, Nicola. Morning, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I, I, you can't actually start the, with the context of the weekend without going back to the 1st of April, when um, Israelis attacked that uh, consulate building um, in Damascus that killed 13 people, including several senior Iranian generals. And that attack had to go, uh, had to have some sort of retaliation. So the Iran Iranians have been very measured in how they've done that attack. Uh, they've waited some time. Well, we were sat on the edge of our seats on Saturday night when over 300 missiles, there were 185 drones, 36 cruise missiles, and 110 ballistic missiles made their way towards Israel. Now, the international effort, America uh, particularly taking a heavy load here, but also the Royal Air Force, uh, managed to take out most of those. I think seven got through. They seemed to target and hit um, um, a Nevatim air base, which is a an Israeli air base down to the south of the country. And whilst that's interesting, it's interesting because that air base is where the F-35 fighters are based, which would have conducted the attack on the 1st of April. So there's a certain symmetry. Iran said almost immediately after the attack, that's it, we've um, we've retaliated from the uh, from your attack on the 1st of April, we're drawing a line under it. The question is whether that line has also been drawn by Israel. Sean, it's really interesting, actually, and, and I absolutely get what Nick means and what you mean. I, I was trying to earlier talk about the impact and where this puts the people involved. I mean, a week ago, we were hearing quite rightly of criticism from within Israel, of Benjamin Netanyahu. Everybody knows what I think about October the 7th. I'm talking about the situation that's unfolded. There's no doubt there's pressure on him. In fact, there were debates in this country, uh, whether or not, about, oh, we shouldn't be arming Israel. And suddenly Lord Cameron came out and did a 20, 24 hours later, said we should do. But you said that what happened on the 1st of April, somebody said something an hour ago, would Netanyahu have arranged that because he knew Iran would retaliate so that he could say to the Israeli people today, look, they've done something inside our land? Is, is war, is it like that tactic-wise? Have the Iranians done it to, you know, tick a box for Hamas and say, we're with you? Is it, that, is it like that, my friend? Well, I think the point you make, um, Jeremy, is absolutely right, that we, we see things at face value. Some of your comments from some of your uh, listeners and um, what the audience have, have, have concerned that we're heading towards, sparring towards World War Three. But that would forget the fact that there is some of this about reputation. Um, Iran, for example, um, does not want to start a war. It does not want to provide Israel and America an excuse for targeting its fledgling nuclear program because that's taken years to develop. And bluntly, by the time it's, it's when, not if, um, Iran gets nuclear weapons, that will be the ultimate deterrent against any further attacks by Israel and or the US. So it, it's quite interesting seeing how the players... Uh, get involved in these conflicts. The point you make about Netanyahu's objectives, one of the things that's a bit curious is that he was attacking the uh, Hamas in the south of uh, um, Gaza. He had his foot on the throat of Hamas, yet he took that foot off, withdrew most of his forces and left uh, one brigade left. And you sort of question why from a military perspective. And one of the answers might be that Netanyahu's made clear that um, he also wants to solve the Hezbollah um, issue the same way he's setting about solving the Hamas issue. And if he was to be attacked by Iran, as has happened, that might give him licence to go ahead and finally deal with the Hezbollah threat to the north. I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the coming days. And Sean, can you just talk to us a little bit about the military equipment that was utilised over the weekend, both <laughs> the Iron Dome um, of Israel and the involvement of the UK in protecting against those, those drones and missiles? How was the UK involved and how is that separate to the Iron Dome? Yeah, I mean, with the time available, I think what we uh, we should say, it's layered defence. Um, so what you want to do is that uh, Israel's a relatively small country, Ballistic missiles fly very fast, so you don't want to wait until they get into your country's airspace before you shoot them down. Ideally, you want to shoot them down as far away as possible. And this is where there was an international effort. For example, a lot of these um, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles were actually shot down in, in, in Jordanian airspace, and you can't do that without the help of the Jordanians. So a lot of the layered defence, you've got to uh, identify the targets, 
track them and then target them. And that's where almost certainly satellite imagery, US international effort. But as you get closer to Israel itself, then you need to have a sort of short, um, short distance protection. And that's where Iron Dome itself fits in. Um, because bluntly, 185 drones were launched by Iran. Iran would have known that they would not have got through. Those drones okay, are I, like the Shahid 136. Though, I, Sean, can I ask a question? Because you both said that, and I don't disagree with it. If this is about retaliation and face saving, how do you explain to the Iranian people that none of it got through and it wasn't successful? Or do you dress it up as successful on the basis of a few craters at an airport? And I'm not being disrespectful. I get what you're talking about in terms of tactic, but wouldn't the people want more or not? Well, yeah, but again, um, Jeremy, you're absolutely right. But the, you'll be remember that the, immediately after the attacks, the Iranians were saying they had completely destroyed the Nevatim air base and uh, literally blown it to oblivion. Um, and so, therefore, they were selling that as success. The airbase from which the attacks on 1st of April were done with these stealth fighters, we have struck at the heart of Israel's military capability. Well, the pictures that came out, and I think you're showing some of them now, show a few holes that were um, um, blasted in Nevatim, but by all accounts, um, the operations have continued as normal. I mean, bear in mind, Nevatim is three very big runways. It's actually very difficult to take that airbase out. But you can see that from an, um, a, an information perspective, both sides are able to claim a degree of success. Yeah. And is that why it's been suggested that, you know, world leaders encourage Netanyahu, who arguably has the ball in his court, that he de-escalate? I don't believe for a second that that would be taken to very kindly by Netanyahu. But what are the different options here? Unfortunately, we've got to be quite brief about it. What kind of different actions could he take to retaliate without escalating the situation? Well, two points, Nick. First of all, it's not necessary to retaliate. Uh, I think part of the international community, UN Security Council resolution was all about you, 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 had, you started this on the 1st of April. This was the retaliation action. Why do you need to do more? If he does decide to do more, it could be a, a very surgical military strike onto a, an Iranian military facility, again providing warning, no casualties, and potentially that would allow a Netanyahu to have the last word. But it is very dangerous risk of escalation should he do that. Uh, Sean, amazing as ever. Really good to have you on. Thank you, military Thank you so analyst much. Sean Bell. Let's take a look now at some of this morning's front pages you're waking up to in The Times. Dominating the news, of course, Israel vying for revenge after Iran's uh, airstrike. But world leaders say, please be calm in the Middle East. Step aside from Brink, says the Mirror, as Iran is warned by leaders of the G7 that its attack on Israel has put the region on the brink of war. And it's time the world faces evil. The evil empire in Tehran, writes the Mail, as President Joe Biden blocks an instant retaliation from Israel.